Thanks a lot, Kristen. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our presenters today. Uh, first, this is Dr. Alyssa Cordner, who's Associate Professor and Paul Garrett Fellow at Whitman College. Her research focuses on environmental sociology, the sociology of risk and disasters, environmental health and justice, and public engagement in science and policy making. She's co-director of the PFAS Project Lab, an interdisciplinary research group that's been working on PFAS issues since 2014. Uh, joining here is Dr. Uh, Kimberly Garrett, an environmental health researcher working at the intersection of environmental toxicology, public health, and environmental justice. She's a postdoc research associate at Northeastern University and also is working in the interdisciplinary PFAS project lab. Her current work involves modeling presumptive PFAS contamination sites and studying the interactions of environment, communities, and governments on PFAS contamination. So I think uh, uh, I'm going to move right into the presentation, and I'm so uh, so delighted you're joining us today. So uh, I'm not sure which one of you would like to go first, but please go ahead. Great. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I'm going to start us off, and then Kim will take over. Um, thank you again for this warm welcome. It's really wonderful to be here. And uh, I am uh, at Whitman College, which is in eastern Washington state, in the traditional homelands of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. Um, and uh, we're very pleased to be able to share our recently published paper with you. Um, uh, I am the co-director of the PFAS Project Lab, which is an interdisciplinary research group focusing on um, issues of, of sort of all things PFAS from a, a social science and environmental health science perspective. Um, and our one of our major goals is to uh, make uh, information about PFAS and research findings very broadly available. So we're especially excited to be able um, to share findings with you all today. Uh, we're going to be talking specifically about this paper, which was published in middle of October in ESNT Letters. And I'd like to really also thank uh, all the co-authors on the paper, um, Ricky Salvatore, who is uh, a now graduate of, um, of Northeastern um, and uh, has uh, moved on to a, a wonderful and very um, policy relevant career in, um, in a state agency. Um, Kira Moak is uh, another undergraduate collaborator. Um, Grace Poudrier is a, a grad student working in our lab. Um, Linda Birnbaum, I think needs no, uh, no description. Um, uh, Greta Goldman um, has been the a sort of leader of our uh, PFAS, the social cost of PFAS group, um, Mark Miller with NIEHS, um, Charles, of course, um, Maddie Pullen is a former uh, Whitman student, um, and Julia Farshovsky Farsh is at Northeastern. So really fortunate to have such a, um, a broad and interdisciplinary research group. Um, I, I expect that many of you are, are very PFAS literate, so I'm going to really breeze through a, a quick overview. Um, generally, the thing is when we're thinking about concerns about PFAS in the environment, we're talking about a risk of both point source and non-point source um, sources of potential exposure. Um, and because these chemicals are so environmentally persistent and they're so uh, mobile um, in water systems, we end up with contamination coming from many different places. Um, it can be measured in, in many different places, and then, of course, there are many different potential sources of exposure. We're also especially concerned about PFAS in terms of environmental inequality and justice issues. I just, um, we, we would just put up here a couple examples of projects that we have ongoing in our research uh, lab. So one of them looking at how tribal drinking water systems and the population served by those tribal systems are underrepresented in federal drinking water testing. Um, uh, another project looking at how people of color, low income populations and people with low English, um, lim limited English, excuse me, proficiency um, are disproportionately exposed to PFAS using the case of New Jersey, which has uh, really excellent excellent and um, uh, fine scale drinking water data. And then a, a third um, collaborative project with some other folks uh, also looking at how um, uh, carceral facilities in the US, including um, juvenile and adult detention facilities and uh, prisons and jails um, are, are, are often proximate to uh, sites of presumptive PFAS contamination. About half of them um, are uh, proximate and in a, a sort of um, hydrologically appropriate location um, where there could be concerns for PFAS con um, exposure. Um, so uh, what do we know about where PFAS um, uh, can be detected? Well, unfortunately, there's no, since there's no MCL for PFAS at the federal level currently, uh, we don't have systematic nationwide 
um, high quality data on PFAS and drinking water. Um, UCMR3 provided really valuable data. However, it looked at a very small number of PFAS. The reporting levels were, um, were quite high, especially compared to the levels that are of concern for human health. Um, and they uh, really focused on large um, drinking water systems, um, had no private well testing, UCMR doesn't, um, doesn't include private wells, uh, and there were only a very small number of uh, small water systems. UCMR5, um, planned to start up next year, uh, will include more PFAS, it will have lower reporting levels, um, it will uh, uh, include more small water systems. Um, so this is a, certainly um, a data that we are excited to see. However, the sampling won't finish until 2025, so we're years away from seeing this data on the federal level. At the state level, um, sampling occurs um, uh, based on the regulatory initiatives in those states. Some states have implemented enforceable drinking water standards um, for some PFAS, and others have no uh, enforceable um, or even guidance values, um, making uh, drinking water testing state by state very uneven. Um, so, where are PFAS as far as we know? Um, this map shows our known contamination site database. This is a database we've been maintaining since 2017 that identifies uh, known sources or sites of PFAS contamination. Note this isn't every single drinking water detection out there. Um, uh, rather, we're trying to identify all of the known sources of that contamination, so landfills, airports, um, DOD facilities, et cetera. Um, and if you zoom in on certain parts of the country, it looks like, wow, New Hampshire, that's really where all the contamination is. Um, so this map would suggest that there's basically no contamination um, in, uh, in some parts of New England or no contamination just over the Minnesota border in Iowa. Um, but in fact, that's because uh, Minnesota has done a lot of drinking water testing. Um, New Hampshire's done a lot of drinking water testing and site investigation. Um, and so uh, what we argue is that um, the location of known PFAS contamination, it really reflects uh, uh, where states have done the testing, it doesn't necessarily just reflect where contamination um, occurs. And so the goal of our paper here that we're talking about today is to fill this gap by developing a model of presumptive PFAS contamination. Um, and the idea here is if you don't have high quality data saying where um, where PFAS uh, are found in the environment or in drinking water systems, um, where should you start? Uh, where should states uh, focus their testing? Are there certain industries that um, are, are more of a concern for PFAS contamination than others? How might this approach reveal certain concerns about environmental inequalities or particular public health concerns? Um, we know that this is a, a priority for both the federal government and for many state governments. And indeed, our model um, uh, builds directly on existing regulatory um, uh, approaches, as well as uh, existing academic studies that concretely link um, measured PFAS data with particular types of, of sites. Um, and so this brings us um, to our model of presumptive PFAS contamination. Um, basically, we took, uh, as I said, existing data coming out of academic studies and regulatory initiatives that linked uh, PFAS um, levels in the environment with some uh, type of facility. And we identified three general categories of facilities that we argue should be presumed to have PFAS contamination in the absence of high quality testing data to the contrary. And those three types of, uh, of sites are locations where AFFF or fluorinated firefighting foams have been discharged into the environment. This would include, of course, um, large airports that uh, do um, uh, AFFF discharge as part of their training and testing requirements. And then, of course, if there was uh, an airplane crash, it would also include a lot of military facilities, um, and it would include things like railroad uh, fires as well. Um, uh, certain types of industrial facilities, and uh, we'll talk uh, more in a second about the specific identification of those facilities, um, but as I said, we uh, looked at existing academic and regulatory initiatives, and we um, synthesized those lists and then pulled um, out of those lists only the facilities that we had a high level of confidence um, should be presumptive, that they are probable sites of contamination, not just possible. And then finally, um, the third category of, uh, of facilities would be sites related to PFAS containing waste. So this might be um, landfills, wastewater treatment plants. It would also be things like um, locations where sewage sludge has been applied to agricultural land. So we have this conceptual model. How do we operationalize it? Um, uh, 
so uh, if you take a look here, this is one of the figures from our, get my cursor over here, um, from our paper. Um, our conceptual model identifies oh, these three types of facilities. Um, and then we attempted to map as many of these facility types as possible. Uh, I won't run through each of these different components, but just know that all of the information in green here, these are the things that we were able to map um, because they have high quality geolocated nationwide data sets telling us, for example, where all of the, the AFFF certified airports are, um, where all the wastewater treatment plants are. Um, however, there are other types of facilities that based on our conceptual model, we would, we would say are presumptive sites of contamination, but we're not able to map them because either there's no nationwide data set or there is no geocoded um, uh, data set. Uh, um, in some cases, there's really no, no uh, uh, specific data at all. Um, so for example, um, we would certainly include in our presumptive contamination model, all the agricultural lands where PFAS contaminated sludge has been applied, but there's no, there's no data set that lets us map that. So that we, um, we identify these types of sites as um, expected under our model, but not, um, uh, they're not able to be mapped. Uh, here are the, um, the uh, different categories of industry facilities that we identified. So when we put together um, 11 academic and regulatory initiatives, uh, we identified over 90 different NICS codes. And um, these are the um, a, a classification, a, a North American industry classification code um, that uh, sorts different facilities based on industry type. Um, and there were over 90 of these NICS codes that were identified in at least one uh, regulatory or academic regulatory initiative or academic study. We decided to only include those NICS codes that were identified by at least four of these initiatives. Um, because again, our, our goal is to really develop a model that is conservative enough that it is actionable, um, and conservative enough that it can be um, used in prioritization. And it's actually very useful to folks who are really trying to uh, figure out where these um, well, where contamination exists, um, and this list is available um, as part of the supplementary information document that is freely available with our paper. Uh, so, what does this look like um, on the um, on the left here? You see um, just a screenshot of our known contamination site database, um, and then on the um, on the right, you see that same uh, location but uh, the presumptive contamination uh, PFAS sites. This certainly um, shows that the uh, uh, we're seeing a lot more sites in that presumptive contamination model. However, it's also important to emphasize that we feel very strongly that this is an under, this, this map here is an underestimation of presumptive contamination because of those data challenges I talked about um, a couple of slides ago. There are lots of types of facilities that we just don't have nationwide data on. There are also um, some data problems with the data we were able to access. So for example, about a quarter of the, um, the uh, industries that we downloaded using those NICS codes, about a quarter of those didn't have high quality geolocation data. Um, so we weren't able to include them in our map and they had to be excluded. Uh, and so even though this, this map um, uh, and, and our, you know, our, our mapping as part of the paper identifies over 57,000 presumptive sites of PFAS contamination, we feel very confident this is an underestimation of where presumptive contamination actually um, exists uh, in the US. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Kim, um, who's gonna talk about why we feel uh, uh, confident that this map is not an overestimation, but is actually an underestimation. And that's through um, a pretty detailed um, uh, validation, validation process that she led for us. Great, thank you. Um, so if you read through our paper, there's not a lot of detail on this validation process, but I'm excited to talk to you about it. Um, it unfortunately didn't make it into the word count, but all this information is available in the supplementary information. So to assess our model's accuracy, we compared our presumptive contamination data set with our list of known contamination sites. And this map shows the known contamination sites. The presumptive map was produced independently from the map of known contamination sites, so we can see how many known sites our model captured. We manually compared our known contamination data to our presumptive model, zooming in on the map to see if known contamination sites were included in the presumptive model and checking to see that they were in the correct locations. We completed this validation in a total of 10 states. 
five states with the highest number of known contamination sites and five with the median number of known sites. Within those, those states, we focused on four counties, two with the highest number of known contamination sites and two with the median. So this allowed us to assess the model's validity under different conditions and in different regions of the country. So in areas with lots of testing like New Hampshire and those with less like Tennessee or Mississippi. The difference between the states with the highest number of known sites compared to even the median is striking. From this table, we can see that New Hampshire with a robust state testing program has over 450 known contamination sites. California with the second most known contamination sites has over 250. The states with the median number of sites though have under 100 and most have less than 10 known contamination sites in the whole state. That really is a testament to the need for statewide and systematic testing. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we manually validated the data points on our presumptive contamination map compared to our known data. Here are two examples of this comparison. So we oversampled in locations with more PFAS testing like New Hampshire, expecting that these locations would be more likely to include, no, include known sites that are outside of our conceptual model. We expected our model to be the least accurate in these places, so we wanted to check what our lowest accuracy might be. We can see an example of a mismatch at the northern tip of New Hampshire. In the map to the left, there are two known sites represented by purple dots near the top, but they're not reflective in the presumptive map to the right. These sites likely fell, of, fell outside of our presumptive parameters or we didn't have geolocation data. Our model's lowest accuracy was 52%, which was still higher than what we expected. Our accuracy was much higher in other states. Our model captured 100% of the few known contamination sites in Tennessee. The dots shown in the map above are indeed incorporated in the presumptive map below. Next slide, please. So here are the results of our validation. The last column, total matches, shows the accuracy of our conceptual model. Our parameters captured 72% of known contamination sites. It's also interesting to note that if we exclude New Hampshire, the state with the lowest accuracy and highest error, our model captures 92% of known contamination sites. The column for observed matches shows the accuracy of the plotted map. The difference between our total matches and the observed matches shows the need for high quality geolocation data. And I'd like to review some of the challenges that led to this gap in accuracy. Next slide, please. So the accuracy of our model is higher than that of the plotted map. The map is an underestimation of sites reflecting challenges like issues with geolocation. There were also issues with land use designations. For example, some sites were listed as landfills on the known list, but they had been reclassified as city parks or shopping malls fell under new ownership, or um, these facilities were built on top of formerly active waste sites. And so we didn't see them in our presumptive search. It's important to note that our model is intentionally conservative. We defined presumptive sites based on fairly rigid criteria, and it's likely that there are lots of other sites that we could include in future work, sites like septic storage. Emerging research on biosolids suggests that septic waste is a source of PFAS contamination. However, septic storage facilities fell outside of the conservative parameters of our model. And I have two examples of this error uh, shown in a supplementary table. Um, and we can see that there is a landfill and landfills should be in our presumptive model, but for whatever reason, they were unable to be matched on our physical map, but they were included in the expected or the, the model. Um, and then below we have a septic compost facility, which we didn't see in our map and we technically didn't expect to, um, but hopefully there's room for expanding our model as more evidence comes out. Um, next slide, please. So even under the conservative parameters of our model, we found over 57,000 presumptive contamination sites in the US. Here's a figure categorizing these sites. Industrial facilities account for the highest number of sites, followed by wastewater treatment plants, military sites, and airport. This certainly gives us some starting points for PFAS testing. Next slide, please. 
This model provides a framework through which regulators, researchers, residents, and other decision makers can identify presumptive PFAS contamination sites. And we hope that it will aid in prioritizing locations for monitoring, regulation, and remediation. In the spirit of collaboration and ethical data management, this paper is open access and we can provide our data set by request. In fact, we've already received data requests from multiple state and municipal regulators, water systems, researchers at academic institutions, nonprofits, and environmental organizations. Um, Alyssa, would you like to add anything about the applications of this work? I, I think that we are we are especially excited to see this used in various ways, um, whether that is expanding the model, as you mentioned. Um, we've received some wonderful uh, ideas about expanding it to, to think not just about presumptive contamination, but presumptive uh, exposure. Where might we expect exposure to take place, either due to um, drinking water systems, um, uh, surface water, and other hydrologic systems? Um, we're also thinking about atmospheric transport and airborne emissions. Um, so I think there are a lot of ways where we could see uh, this being useful in our research context. And then we are just very excited to see um, this being useful to folks who are PFAS decision makers. Wow, you know, this um, this is familiar to a lot of people, I'm guessing, on the call, this idea of how can we, you know, how can we have some sort of screening criteria for locations? Um, and the, the goal of this paper is to help folks not have to recreate the wheel. Here is a model that is um, has been carefully validated, uh, that has gone through uh, rigorous peer review, that has a, an interna interdisciplinary research team um, behind it, um, and so we're just very excited to see it used out in the out in the world. Um, Kim, go ahead. And so just to just to finish up. Um, our research group is working on this and a lot of other things related to uh, PFAS and environmental justice, um, uh, PFAS communication uh, and outreach to uh, groups like health professionals, um, work with impacted communities, studying PFAS governance at, at various levels and thinking about things like regrettable substitution, um, PFAS definitional questions. Um, so a lot of uh, uh, different and inter interdisciplinary work. And then just um, in addition to this paper, last month we also had another paper come out in One Earth that focuses on uh, governance um, of uh, PFAS, a focus on the US, but also making some international um, connections as well. Uh, and um, uh, Kim made this very nice, um, uh, I I even forget the name of what that little thing is, Kim, that you can scan. What is that called? It's a QR code. A QR code. I did know that. Thank you. Um, a little QR code that can take you directly to the paper. I think that we've also shared the link with the organizers as well. Um, the paper is behind a, fire, a, a paywall, but we have a link that takes you past that paywall, or we're also happy to share it with you um, by email. Um, so, and then also just to uh, reiterate that this paper is also available open access um, and we're happy to answer additional questions um, that folks might have. Um, our larger lab group uh, includes other um, uh, sort of co-investigator and research uh, scientists um, uh, in multiple disciplines, multiple institutions, um, other postdocs, uh, a number of um, uh, graduate and undergraduate stu um, students, and then some wonderful community partners. Uh, so thank you so much, and we look forward to some uh, discussion and questions. Great. There's a lot of information there. Really <laughs> exciting. <laughs> I really appreciate it. So uh, we have some questions here and, and some time, uh, actually, for you to answer them. Um, Silent Spring, Ruth Ann Riddell, great idea to do this, a great resource. If I read it right, you had very high match on validation for all states except New Hampshire. Why would that be? Kim, do you want to talk a little more about this? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I love to talk about the the reasons that New Hampshire is a little bit different from the other states. So New Hampshire has a really robust uh, testing program, and they went out and they tested so many different water sources, um, not just places we would think of as the source of PFAS contamination. So when we look through the data set, we see expected industrial sites, right? But we also see things like um, country road number 12 uh, stream under the, that flows under the, the street. And so it's, uh, that likely is not the source of PFAS contamination, but they have a lot of data about where PFAS is in New Hampshire. Um, we also had things like businesses uh, that 
occupied space that was formerly used as an industrial site or something like that. And so really parsing through uh, historical use and the context of those locations is was a challenge. And so that's why um, we wanted to look at New Hampshire specifically to see how accurate our parameters are um, in filtering out some of those uh, unlikely sources like um, country road number 12 and it's, it's stream bed. <laughs> Yeah, I think if you look at the, um, and, and this is all in that validation um, information that is in the supplementary supplementary information document that goes along with the paper, if you look at the types of uh, sites that are, um, uh, that are not captured in our presumptive contamination model, but that are known contamination sites, especially in New Hampshire, but also in some other places in the country, um, uh, there, there are kind of two categories. One is places where it really makes sense that there would be PFAS contamination, but we're not yet at a place of saying every site like this, we think should be a presumptive site. And that includes, as Kim mentioned, septage sites. It includes uh, dry cleaner facilities because we don't have a good way of differentiating um, uh, with Nix codes places that do dry cleaning on site versus places that might just be a storefront that um, collect clothes and then send them to a processing place. At the processing place, we would expect a, a PFAS use is, is quite likely, but maybe not at the storefront. And so we're not at a place of saying every single facility with a dry cleaning mix code is presumptive. So there are those sites where like, oh, yeah, it makes sense there would be PFAS. And then there are the places where we think we have no idea why there is PFAS there, like Country Road 12. Um, there's some senior centers in New Hampshire. There's at least one pizza parlor. And so it is, it's very possible, as Kim said, that, you know, because of uh, changing industrial use patterns, um, there's been some, some great work in environmental sociology on how um, urban spaces, uh, industrial uses can cycle pretty quickly. And so 10 years ago, that place, you know, might have, uh, might have been um, a car wash, and now it is a uh, pizza place or something like that. Um, so maybe there is a reason why this place is a, a PFAS contamination source. It's also possible, though, that um, some of the testing in New Hampshire picked up PFAS contamination that is not actually linked to where that contamination was found, um, because maybe that, you know, pizza place is downstream from an industrial facility. Or it's also possible that um, some places have, um, you know, we might be getting closer to what Cousins and I'll talk about as this sort of background level of contamination that is out there all the time um, and that is concerning for, um, you know, for human health um, and the environment. Levels of PFAS that are detected in rainwater above um, health-based uh, guideline levels for multiple countries. And so that's another question that we have going forward. Our known contamination site database very explicitly has not identified a, um, a level below which we won't include a site in our um, database. We don't think that's our call to make. So we, if, if someone finds contamination at a specific source, um, we have included it in our database. And that does mean that we have you know, a few sites where the levels of PFAS contamination might be less than 10. Um, we also have then, of course, sites with uh, tens of thousands of parts per trillion or 100,000 100, parts per trillion. Um, so there is a lot of range also in terms of the level of contamination at these known sites. Okay, uh, another question is, are you keeping uh, any kind of record or historical record of uh, uh, government agencies, uh, basically state-based, are taking this information and using it. Are you doing kind of a follow-up to see what is working, what isn't, and where the questions are? We haven't gotten that far in terms of a follow-up, but we do keep track of every time we share the data um, with someone. Um, part of our user agreement is asking them to let us know what they do with it down the road. Um, so if they use it in a report, if they use it in an analysis, we ask them to follow up with us later and um, and let us know what they um, what they have done. Um, so I think we're still uh, we're still too early to see what people are doing, but we're just really excited to be um, getting the model out there and the data out there. And I'll also say, you know, some some folks have requested the data, which is great. Um, the the methods are also very clearly explained in the paper um, in terms of exactly where you get the the data sets um, and uh, exactly what criteria we use to screen individual points. Um, so, for example, if if you wanted to recreate this in your location, 
and um, you don't want to uh, remove sites that have low geolocation accuracy, you can do that um, just by recreating the methods in the paper. Okay, we have a lot of questions here, we have a, but we'll make sure you send them, we send them to you so you can answer. Yes, uh, are you in touch, this is from Sasha Jen, uh, are you in touch with colleagues in Europe who could use your methodology to do a mapping in uh, EU? We have, um, we've shared it with uh, European contacts that we have, we've been in touch with um, a, a sort of multi-country research group that is working on a, an EU map, um, and we've also shared it with folks who are within um, uh, EU regulatory agencies. If you have other people we should share it to, we are very happy to do that. We have sent it as broadly as we know how, um, and we have been in touch with folks, but we're very happy to send it more broadly as well. Perfect, okay. And then from Beverly Thorpe, are all states testing for all PFAS or only some PFAS such as a PFO and P PFOS? How do you define PFAS contamination? All substances in the class or just the uh, presence of any PFAS? Um, so uh, most states are not testing um, at this point uh, and no state is testing for all PFAS. Um, the testing that happens most often is using the EPA's 537.1 method or some variation of that. Like I know Wisconsin has a, a, a slightly different method that um, captures a few more compounds. Um, so this is absolutely a concern. But you know, we talk about PFAS contamination, and our conceptual model is able to talk about that very broadly. However, when it um, in terms of any PFAS, um, uh, but that's because the conceptual model doesn't have to actually measure the PFAS out there. Um, and, and so uh, when we're talking about the known contamination sites with measured PFAS data, our lab will include um, any PFAS that have been tested for. Uh, you know, pragmatically, that means mostly we have data on PFOA, PFOS, um, and a handful of other compounds. Um, and so this is absolutely a concern in terms of, uh, you know, we're measuring just the tip of the PFAS iceberg uh, when, we're, when we're talking about, um, even if we're talking about the 29 chemicals in the EPA method, that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the tens of, or over, over 12,000 chemicals that the EPA says might be in this chemical class. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Dupree asked, does a presumptive model map indicate proximity to tribal lands, or are you aware of any work that shows such relationship between PFAS contamination and potential exposures on tribal lands? Yes. So if you go to our uh, publicly available map, if you go to pfasproject.com and then you go to the um, PFAS sites and community resources map, um, each of the layers has a tribal lands data layer that you can click on. So that absolutely is part of the, the mapping experience that folks can do. Um, and this is also something that we're, um, we had a, a conference paper on this and we're actively working on this exact question. Um, uh, the Tribal PFAS Working Group is a, um, a, a, a tribal tribally run um, a group focused on um, PFAS issues of specific concern to tribal communities. We've been working on, uh, working with them for about, um, Oh gosh, um, close up, close on a year now, to develop some um, information, uh, some fact sheets, and other resources that are useful to them. Um, but this is this is absolutely a concern and something that uh, that we're working on, and we hope other folks are working on as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, let's see. And this one, uh, it, it's it's a. Uh... It's a kind of a given piece of uh, information that military bases are the primary source of PFAS in drinking water. But given the, the, the amount and number of uh, other sources of PFAS, would you see this be uh, a, a piece of information is not quite correct given the other sources? You know, I think that the reason why we have this sense that military bases are responsible for most of the PFAS drinking water contamination is because there has been um, uh, testing from, uh, in and on and around military bases around the country. So if you look at, you know, for example, Kim um, showed the map of Tennessee, um, the the known PFAS sites that are in states with very little testing tend to be military um, military sites or else uh, really dramatic industrial or um, landfill contamination episodes. Um, so I, I in no way want to downplay the, um, the role of the military in the PFAS contamination crisis and the responsibility that Department of Defense has to, um, to uh, uh, engage very proactively and fully on cleanup efforts. Um, as well as their responsibility to uh, stop the ongoing uses of PFAS, um, for example, ongoing um, uses related to AFFF. Um, I do think that there, uh, you know, 
as we test for more, um, as we test for PFAS in more locations, we will continue to find contamination that is not linked to military facilities. And if you look at a place like New Hampshire, there certainly are military facilities there, but there are a lot of other places um, that are known contamination sites as well. And that, that's true around the country. So um, uh, certainly the military is a, a, a major um, responsible party here. And uh, there are many other places where the PFAS contamination just hasn't yet been measured. Uh, okay, and just one last question. You you mentioned uh, uh, moving forward and, and talking about uh, air, uh, using mm -hmm. air contamination. How, how do you see that happening? Well, one concern about, uh, you know, our point source based model is, okay, so here's this, here's the location, here's the site, but how are we actually then exposed to contamination from that site? And one way could be through water discharge um, or soil contamination or contamination of the groundwater. But another way would be airborne emissions and how those um, airborne emissions would then uh, travel, make it into, um, um, you know, could, could end up in rainwater, could end up in soil, could end up in the food system. So this is, um, this is still, for our research group, this is a, a thing that we have talked about but have not yet um, done any active research on, but we would love to see um, other folks, uh, you know, work on this in terms of um, uh, questions of modeling, questions of how you how you do identify these um, potential uh, exposure locations. Okay, I'm getting a high sign from Kristen saying that <laughs> I've indulged uh, all the people who've asked the questions and these wonderful answers that you're giving. So I just want to thank you very much for your presentation and, the, and uh, this ability to talk with you and get more detail on it. And I'm sure we'll have lots of questions of people reaching out to you with ideas and, and uh, uh, a desire to talk more about this. It's so important. So thanks very much for this presentation. And I'll turn it over to Kristen now to close us all down here. Thank you very much.